Okay, this is Stefan Kinsella. It is Thursday, March 7th, 2013. The Kinsella on Liberty podcast. I'm talking to Derek Kana. Derek, say hello. Hey, welcome. Thanks for having me on. Sure, yeah. I thought we'd just have a quick talk about uh, some of the activities you've been engaged in lately. And uh, uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, tell people who you are and what you're doing right now. Sure. So, um, yeah, I was a, a Hill staffer for a number of years and worked on two presidential campaigns. And uh, I, I, I uh, now am off Capitol Hill, but leading advocacy for technology reform um, and uh, conservative and libertarian laws that will facilitate innovation and um, the free market. Let me ask you, um, so w- which campaigns were you working on? I worked for Mitt Romney's 08 campaign, and I was in an ancillary capacity for his 2012 campaign. Okay, so would you describe yourself as a, uh, you said conservative libertarian, are you Republican, libertarian? What's your kind of philosophical political background? I'm a Republican. I meant that I'm working on policies that, uh, that, that are tailored towards the Republican libertarian audience, but I'm a Republican. And uh, you don't mind talking to anarchists like me? <laughs> I, I talk to whomever, and uh, I find a lot of continuity on all of these issues. Uh, the, the, most of these issues are are more about those who get it than those than uh, those who get it, and those who don't get it, than partisan issues. Yeah, uh, what's uh, I'm, I'm a I'm a big uh, libertarian radical type, you know, fire breathing anarchist, uh, government hating type, uh, and also very cynical about politics and political activism. But I will say that. Um, First time in my memory in, in recent, uh, say, last year, there's been a couple of actually improvements in politics. One was, well, today was the Rand Paul thing where he got the Obama administration to actually answer his question about bombing and killing American you know, citizens on U.S. soil. That was a slight improvement, I would think, uh, after his filibuster. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I'd, be, I'd like to hear Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Uh, another one was um, in the America Invents Act that Obama signed about a year, year and a half ago. Um, there was actually a slight improvement in patent law, which was the expansion of the prior commercial user defense, which uh, is the only improvement in copyright or patent law that I can remember ever happening in the 200-year history of this country. Um, and then the defeat of SOPA was another huge victory, or at least a preventing of a, uh, Absolutely. Of a problem. And then the other one was uh, the thing you were involved with, which was the, um, the DMCA interpretation of the rules by the Library and of Congress on cell phone and now even tablet unlocking. So I wanted to talk to you about that and uh, anything else you would like to talk about. But um, uh, let's just uh, – l- let's go back a little bit um, – uh, to your the the first thing you sort of became noted for that I learned about your name from was when you were uh, basically fired if I get that right because of the memo you published on the web which was hastily taken down which was a a really good I won't say anti copyright but uh, document but it was a memo from a Republican um, caucus or agency in in, uh, in Congress which was arguing about all the harms that copyright does to the economy and why we need to radically scale back or at least reform copyright. And uh, you, you want to talk a little bit about that, uh, that episode? Sure. Well, I would, a little bit, I would just do your characterization of the memo, and uh, maybe if you put up in the show notes, people can read it, come to their own conclusions, and see what they think. Yep. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I worked for the House Republican Study Committee, and I was asked to come up with new ideas and push the box and, and, and uh, work on technology issues. And uh, so one of the issues that was obviously important to me was copyright reform as well as patent reform. And uh, so I was asked to write a memo on, on, on you know, uh, pro-innovation, pro-free markets, pro-constitution reforms to copyright law. And, uh, you know, I, I jumped into it, and, uh, and I wrote a a report on on the state of copyright law in this country and and, and several recommendations for how it could be improved. And my analysis was that our current system of copyright is radically divergent from that of our founding fathers. And not only is it radically divergent, but it's radically divergent without any real good reason for it being so. So you can imagine that our founding fathers had one system and today we're a different society. So 
Um, we may need to adjust your laws accordingly. It completely makes sense to me. But that's not actually what happened here. It's a situation where content industry lobbyists have perverted the system and to something that doesn't even resemble that of really the Constitution. And uh, so specifically what I pointed out was uh, copyright, uh, I, I reframe the issue of copyright, you know, going back to the Constitution uh, and exposing that the main purpose of copyright is to maximize the content creation and rather than giving a windfall to the content producer. And obviously we support profit, or I support profit, you want the content producer to be well compensated. But the main purpose of copyright under the Constitution is in order to maximize the overall content production. And that means some things that um, may be controversial in today's understanding of this issue. It means, for example, that copyright has to eventually expire. Because if copyright never expires, then those works never go to the public domain and other people can never build on those works. So those are some of the, the, the things that were in the memo um, that really aren't that crazy, um, you know, going back to the system of the founding fathers, um, was basically what I was advocating. Well, let me ask you, what, what was your um, – because you don't think what you wrote was that crazy or that radical, but compared to the mainstream agenda pushed uh, and taught and pushed by Congress and uh, uh, you know, your Republicans and Democrats – I think it was pretty radical. Um, what was what what was your influence in, in, in writing that? Was it uh, libertarian writing, or was it just your own common sense, or w what led you to become such a, a you know comparative radical on this issue? Well, you know, I, I read widely on this issue, and these are things that uh, academics, both on the left and on, but more importantly on the right, have been saying for a long time is that our system of copyright law actually inhibits innovation and it actually stifles the free market. And uh, I believe in copyright, but believing in copyright doesn't mean that you have to support the exact system that we have in law today. Right. So, right. for example, I talked about how individuals could be liable for a billion dollars in damages for content they have in their iPod. That's absurd. Um, that's not based upon a rational decision. Um, I talked about how, um, you know, cop copyright law today, your copyright exists for life plus 70 years, which effectively means that it never enters the public domain. No one can ever build upon that work. Right. Um, so I say it's not that radical because these are things that have been well-versed and talked about um, both on the left and on the right, uh, mainly conservative scholars in the legal community for quite some time. Yeah, I do find in my own experience that uh – Left libertarians and even civil libertarians tend to be remarkably good on this issue. Well, at least the left libertarians. Um, and by good, I mean IP abolitionists. You know, I, I'm in favor of totally abolishing copyright and patent and trademark and trade secret law as they currently exist for for a variety of reasons. Um, but any kind of significant move in that direction would be an improvement. Um, is your uh, is your so so if, if you had to choose, let me ask you this. If you had to choose yourself from your pro political perspective between today's copyright and having no copyright, what would you choose, given that you're not an abolitionist, really? Uh, that's a – what is that called? They call it a Sophie's Choice. Yeah, or um, Hobbes, Hobbes uh, Choice or something. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Hobbes Choice. I mean you know, I'm, not a, I'm not a politician. I don't, I don't think I'm going to need to answer that question. I think there's a lot of good <laughs> things that are copyright -wise. Well, I, I think there is a purpose of copyright, and, and you and I may disagree on that. Uh, I support copyright. I, I support content producers, and I think that – I think our founding fathers recognize that there is a market failure there, and that needs to be implemented. But just because you support copyright does not mean that you support a life plus 70 term of copyright. Well, w would you agree, though, that um, if you're going to have that kind of argument for copyright, um, that – at least the the people advocating it. I mean, it is sort of a deviation from the free market, right? It's kind of a temporary monopoly grant to try to fix some kind of market failure. That's that's the the argument that say your side is in favor of, and you're just sort of recognizing that it's gone too far in doing that. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my art, my article says it's a government created, government instituted, government subsidized content monopoly. You said your article. What article is this? Uh, the report. The oh, the, the, yeah, okay, the paper. Um, 
But do you think that the founders, when they put the copyright and the patent clause in the Constitution, do you think they actually had access to the data that supported their kind of utilitarian intuitions? Or do you think they just were going by a hunch? No, I think this was, this was an, an actual choice. I mean, this was what the British had done with the Statute of Anne in 1714. Um, this was actually a choice that this was the most efficient way to proceed. Uh, I, would, I would say it's a little bit more complicated than utilitarianism. Um, utilitarianism would simply be looking at what maximizes the overall production. I think they believed in a little bit of, you know, if, if you create it, you deserve to be compensated for it. A little bit of the Lockean ideology, right. but also the utilitarian ideology. So I don't right. think that they're always completely divergent. I think it's kind of a blend of the two. Yeah, it seems to me that, I mean, well, I, I, and I've actually looked into this. I've been studying this for a long time, and I'll be honest with you. I still can't tell when the Statute of Anne was, what the right date is on it. I see thing, it's, it's either 1709 or 1710. I think they started debating it in 09. I think they passed it in 10. Uh, just like the uh, the patent statute, which is a statute of monopolies, 17, 1623, 1624. I, I never can figure out the right date to put on it, but it was it was a while back. But um, um, it, it just seems to me that if you're going to come up with an argument that we need this law because it's it promotes creativity, then you at least need to have some evidence to back up your, your case. And I agree it was a choice, but it seems to me it should be a choice backed up by data. And... You know, the founders could perhaps be forgiven for, for making a hunch or a guess, but in the 200-plus years since then, I'm not aware of any conclusive, uncontroversial study that shows that it does – even a minimal copyright enhances creativity at all. It seems to me – let me ask you this. You're a law student right now. Is that correct? Yes. And are you taking – I'm just curious. Are you taking IP courses? Or are you just learning it on your own, or what's your – What's your um, your way of learning about this? Well, I've done you know research on IP issues. I also have a Yale Law Visiting Fellowship, so I do a lot of published stuff as well on IP stuff. But right. Yeah, I think it's just taking classes as well. Yeah. So um, um, one argument I've I've kind of played with in my mind, um, and that I've never seen anyone really respond to, was uh, that that copyright and patent. They, w they would seem to be constitutional because there's a, a clause authorizing it, uh, although I don't think constitutionality means it's legitimate. I mean there's a lot of things the Constitution authorizes that are, in my mind, illegitimate like war and taxes and slavery, etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, – in the Federal Reserve. Um, but the, the, first of all, the clause says that to promote the, uh, the progress of the arts and the sciences. So you could argue that's merely precatory as we say. Uh, or you could argue that it's a condition of the of the grant of power, so that if you can prove, or if the pro pro IP guys can't prove that copyright promotes the progress of the of the sciences, which was the word they used back then to refer to the the literary arts, um, then it's mm -hmm. then the the copyright statute is totally invalid because it hasn't fulfilled the purpose that conditions the grant of power. But I think a be and then a, I think a better argument against even the constitutionality of copyright would be that the copyright clause was enacted in, as part of the Constitution when it was ratified in 1789, and then the Bill of Rights was enacted in 1791, two years later, which had the First Amendment, which basically prohibited federal government laws that restrict freedom of speech and expression, and the courts have mm -hmm. clearly recognized and common sense. Sh you know, would show that there is a conflict or a tension between freedom of speech and expression and the copyright clause because copyright uh, – or the copyright law, I should say, the Copyright Act. Copyright clearly limits what you can say. And so as a prima facie matter, it seems to me that copyright law restricts freedom of speech. And mm -hmm. because it was enacted later, if there's a conflict between the First Amendment and the Copyright Clause of 1789 that the later amendment or the later constitutional provision would govern, just like prohibition was outlawed by the later amendment that overturned the earlier amendment outlawing alcohol, right? I mean mm -hmm. so I would argue that yeah. if there's a conflict between freedom of speech and copyright, then copyright has to fall, and that clearly copyright does prohibit freedom of speech. 
And so it's unconstitutional on those grounds alone. What, what would your kind of just gut take be on that argument? Yeah, I mean, the, the freedom of speech and copyright issue is something that's been talked about in uh, legal circles for quite some time. Um, Mike Masnick just had a piece on that that was pretty informative in, in his website, Tech Dirt. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fascinating um, uh, way of, of looking at copyright. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm in that camp of, um, uh, of, of fully buying that argument, but it's something I'm still taking a look at. It's a, uh, it's a relatively novel approach. Yeah, gotcha. So when when you wrote the memo, did you just were you just trying to crash the party, or did you think you were okay, or or did you know you were being subversive, or what was your thinking when you just released that? No, no, no. So I didn't release it. It was uh, you know went through a normal process of review. In fact, uh, most people in the office uh, read it to get their opinions as well, and our policy director signed off and revised it. And then we took it to our executive director who doesn't normally read policy briefs, but just because we wanted him to be fully aware. And he actually revised the document. Okay. And uh, so, so was it more radical? Was it more radical in this earlier earlier draft? If you feel free to talk about that. Um, in some ways, it's actually less radical. My original article just said these are some of uh, I call it the three myths about copyright. Okay. Um, and those myths those myths were that uh, copyright's primary purpose is to is to um, uh, uh, copyright's primary purpose is to um, incentivize creation uh, or whatever. The, yeah. No, it's, it's to pay the content owner. Mm -hmm. So the primary purpose is to create, you know, the sciences and the arts. Um, and then the other myth was that this leads to the maximum level of innovation and productivity and growth. And um, and then there was a third myth in there that I I, I forgot offhand. Um, but that was how the original paper was, and they, they asked me to add in additional section on what exactly I see as the prescriptive reform. Right. And that's when you start itemizing out what potential bills could look like. That's when you really get much more controversial. Um, I don't think that the original myths were all that controversial. Um, the proposals were a little bit more controversial. But yeah, that's what I was told to do. Sorry, sorry say again? So what, 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 out. what was more controversial? Could you say that again? Yeah, the proposals are a little bit more controversial. Proposals like limiting right. statutory damages or limiting uh, the term of copyright to something more analogous to the Constitution. That's a little bit more controversial. And um, so, you know, we got approval, and I emailed it out to staffers, and the Republican Study Committee was the one who put it out publicly on their website. So who do you, who do you think was the so, – so then what happened? How did they get taken down, and how, what were the repercussions? And do, and do you regret it? Cool. I'm just curious what your kind of take on the whole ep episode is. Sure. So within 24 hours, the Republican Study Committee decided to take the, the, the memo down. Uh, and I was not so thrilled with that decision, of course. But um, no, I, I don't regret having written the memo. I, I was asked to write a memo on this topic. I, I went to the literature. I wrote uh, a conservative argument for a pro-innovation policy towards copyright law. And I think it, it put the issue out there and put it on the table. I mean, it got endorsed by every major tech website and many major conservative groups. American and, 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 groups and libertarian example. and libertarians, I would say. A lot of us libertarians, and libertarians. loved it. Yes. Uh, but they um, so you know it got pretty wide, overwhelming support from a lot of actors who really hadn't thought of these issues critically. Uh, through a conservative lens, so I, I don't regret having written it. Um, obviously, you know, it was written quite quickly, as a lot of things you do on the Hill are. You know, I may have revised some of the language that was used. Yeah, I think that's normal for many documents that people write. It wasn't meant to be a, a uh, it was meant to be an internal product for House staffers to use to right. formalize, you know, legislation. Some people have read it as some sort of a published document. Um, which kind of was, but not in the same way. What, what do you think was the um, what? What was the cause of it being taken down so quickly? Was it was it the content owners, like the music industry, the Hollywood music the movie industry, the uh, interest? Were they putting pressure? Were they was it just a big freak out about it? What, what do you think actually happened uh, that caused it to be taken down so quickly? Well, you know, I, I heard that at least one of our members was uh, very displeased with it. Um, 
at the same time, I knew that many of our members were very excited about it. Um, I was up till two in the morning working with uh, several influential staffers about introducing Bill as early as the next week and would actually enact these reforms. So these weren't hypothetical things. These are things that started to get some real momentum there. Uh, so I can't really speak to exactly what happened, but uh, there's a lot of media accounts on, on kind of what went down. Exactly. Okay. So let me ask you, do, do you think – who do you think would be best positioned for the sort of internet freedom, copyright reform agenda? Would it be the Republicans or the Democrats right now? Because I've heard conflicting arguments on this side, and I have conflicting feelings myself about which party – I mean like Ron Wyden, for example, is one of the leaders on this, and he's a Democrat, I believe. Um, and a lot of, all, all, but on the other hand, my understanding is the Democrats are more in the sort of sway of the California Hollywood content producers uh, influence. Well, I mean, there's two things. So yeah, it's going to be up to Republicans and conservatives and even libertarians to lead the charge in this issue. Um, if Republicans decide that they they actually believe in in, in in being against regulation, that they actually support small businesses, that they actually want economic growth, they're going to have to decide that. If they decide that, which they haven't, then they need to promote policies that go in that direction. And first and foremost is smart intellectual property laws. So uh, that's you, one of the. Go ahead. Well, within the Constitution, it's one of the enumerated powers and one of the primary ways the federal government is is able to be involved in the private sector in a right. productive way. By the way, do do you have any views on the on the Lanham Act, the trademark law, the federal trademark law? Which, in other words, uh, the, the copyright clause authorizes basically patent and copyright law. It doesn't authorize trademark law, which is why the Lanham Act um, has to affect only trademarks that are involved in interstate commerce and that's where there's still a, a big body of state trademark law do you do you, I don't I don't put you on the spot but do you have any thoughts on the federal federalization of trademark law um, no it's a, a fascinating topic it's not something that I have that much familiarity with though I okay I try to get your domain expertise in a few areas and that's not one of them but it's an interesting thing you bring up what about have you looked into patents itself do you have any thoughts on the patent system as it exists right now yeah, so patents are, I mean, the problem with patents is the solutions are extremely complicated, and our system right now is clearly not working. It's clearly led to a troll like system where you have a lot of bad actors really shutting down innovation, and it, it's completely dysfunctional. And kind of a case in point was that Apple and Samsung apparently in 2011 spent more money on litigation and buying patents than they did on research and development. Yeah, you have to admit there's something um, there's something wrong when basically um, hundreds of billions of dollars are being lost or spent on patent and copyright lawsuits. People are going to jail. We we have the U.S. raiding houses in New Zealand and putting British trying to put British grad students in jail for things that are legal in their country. Um, and internet freedom is being threatened. Um, let me ask you this: uh, Were you involved in the SOPA? fight or just observing or what was your – did you have any involvement in that? Sure. So I was very strongly against SOPA. I was working for Senator Scott Brown at the time. Senator Scott Brown came out against SOPA. Um, so, yeah, SOPA was, was, was quite bad news. And for most of us working on that Capitol Hill, uh, we were very disappointed uh, in expecting it to pass. So we were quite pleased to see this groundswell of support for – what many of the younger staffers believed in, which was, you know, this was, had, was completely out of left field, made no sense. Yeah, I'm a little bit concerned about th that that was just a temporary victory for our side and that these types of provisions are going to keep creeping back at the behest of the big content uh, providers in the form of, you know, ACTA and the TPP and other, and, and other things. It's just the pressure is unrelenting. Uh, d have you looked into this or following the TPP? Or things like the, oh, which sure. is the I mean, Trans Pacific the, Partnership the Treaty. Treaty is, yeah. It's really bad news as far as the IP stuff goes. And this is this is their playbook. This should not be surprising. Um, uh, after SOPA, that coalition kind of started to wither away a little bit, saying, okay, we won here. But the MPA, the RA, they didn't stop. In fact, the next day after SOPA, 
they confiscated Mega Upload, uh, you know, the DOJ confiscated Mega Upload's website and their servers. So they've been able to enact a lot of the policies that were within SOPA through law, right. whether it be through shutting down websites or shutting off payments to payment providers. They are able to accomplish that as well. And now they're negotiating on the TPB treaty. Uh, and what they do is they ask for things in, in the treaty that are um, yeah, major next steps, steps that they want, steps that they know that Congress won't approve. And then they go back to Congress and they say we have to pass a law to abide by this brand new right. treaty we just passed. Yeah, they, and they did that with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. They said, you know, nothing to see here. We just have to update the law in order to abide by these international treaties. But the international treaties were the ones that you had negotiated for. So right. It, it, <laughs> yeah, I think this is one and, uh, w one problem with the Constitution and our system is that um, the Constitution elevates treaties to the l to the level of the law of the land. And um, and some presidents even argue that they can just do something similar by executive agreement. And you know, I don't know if you have studied this issue, but there's something called the Bricker Amendment back in the I think 50s, where yeah, yeah. Senator Bricker was trying to get an amendment passed to clarify or to change, to make it clear that no treaty could you know override the civil liberties and other things provided for in the Constitution, and it was defeated narrowly, unfortunately. Uh, so I think the treaty power is one very dangerous thing. We have this international web of treaties, WIPO and um, uh, GATT, things like this, which you know America joins in and foists on the rest of the world. We twist the arms of other countries to sign on to, and then we join it. And then we use the excuse, well, we have an international obligation to reform our municipal, our domestic law to conform to these treaties, which we, of course, pass at the behest of the of the content industries. Um, I think the treaty power is a very dangerous thing. It can, it's starting to help undermine the, uh, the, uh, the rights protected by the constitution. Mm -hmm. So, so let's, let's turn now to, um, the, the other issue. So your most recent activity was, uh, being instrumental in the, the petition, the white house dot gov petition, I believe, um, mm -hmm. to, so let's back up a little bit. The, the copyright law has a, a fairly recent edition, about 15 years old, the DMCA, the D Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which along with the copyright law itself, the regulations for implementation are interpreted and construed by three uh, by periodic three-year decisions of the Librarian of Congress, which is an agency of, of Congress. And... Uh, I think it's an agency of Congress, although the president appoints the librarian of Congress, if I understand how that works. And uh, three years ago, he or she, I think it was a she, said that you know you could unlock your cell phone and that would not count as a violation of copyright law under the DMCA. Because otherwise it looked like it would, because the DMCA outlaws anti-circumvention technology or techniques. Things you can do to yeah. get 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 around digital. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 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 encryption technologies, things like this. Even if the underlying act would not be prohibited by copyright law. So for three years, we had a window where unlocking your cell phone wasn't prohibited. Hey, excuse me, I'm gonna have to call you back and complete this interview. I, I gotta jump on a radio program this minute. Okay. Is that right? Sure. Yeah, we 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 connect up. Sh shortly. Sorry, I'm being beep right now. I'll, we'll, we'll finish this one second. It's a fascinating conversation. Okay, bye. Okay, we're back. We're back online. Uh, actually, I was just about to ask you about the media attention you've been getting, and uh, our diversion was a good illustration of that. So, tell me what's we're we're about to get to your involvement in this petition, the White House .gov petition. Which, by the way, you, you know, you and I talked about it a few weeks ago. When you were thinking about it, and then all of a sudden you did it, and you got the number of votes or subscribers you needed, and then the White House responded. It was incredible because most of these petitions the White House ignores or has BS language, you know, like the the Texas wants to secede petition or whatever. So um, I'm very impressed by this because uh, you had the right instinct. You kept, you found a narrow but important issue to push. So why don't you talk a little bit about your petition and uh, 
and the outcome of that and the media interest since then? Absolutely. Um, so you know, I wrote the main article on this issue uh, for the Atlantic, and it was something that had always been on my radar and had incensed me quite a bit. And uh, basically what happened for your readers to understand a little bit more, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act bans entire classes of modern technology. And every three years, proponents of, of, of being able to use those technologies can petition to the Librarian of Congress to ask for a special exception. And this process is completely dysfunctional and very unfortunate. And um, this year, the Librarian of Congress decided to allow an existing exception for unlocking your phone to expire. And unlocking your phone is where you change the settings to allow for you to use an AT&T phone on another network by switching out the SIM card. And this was asked by the big wireless companies' uh, lobbying association, CTIA, the Wireless Association. So this quite infuriated me, the idea that the federal government was saying what technologies you could and couldn't use and banning a commonly used technology because of being asked by these large companies when there were over 100 wireless carriers who had all petitioned saying, we like unlocking, that's pro-competition. And the idea that individuals could go to jail for doing this for five years uh, really, you know, made my hair, uh, hair on fire. And so I wrote the article for The Atlantic on this, uh, and it got over a million hits and knocked The Atlantic offline. And I said, hey, I guess that there actually are people out there who also care about this issue as much as I do. And uh, so we started a, a national campaign on this issue. And it started small at first, but it started to grow up bigger, and eventually we got to 114,000 signatures in the White House petition. And uh, that meant that the White House was required to respond uh, if we got over 100,000. And uh, not only did the White House respond, but they responded in spades. They came out saying that they are strongly in favor of unlocking, and the FCC announced that they're investigating the situation. And this is a pretty serious uh, reversal, because only 30-some days before the Librarian of Congress's rule went into effect, the Librarian of Congress was in a rulemaking function of the executive branch. So the administration actually changed their mind in about 35 days because of the petition. Yeah. And uh, that kick-started a process that's uh, cascading across Capitol Hill of uh, members of Congress who are trying to fix this problem. Yeah, I agree. It was, uh, it was incredible what you accomplished, uh, and I commend you for that because uh, I'm a cynic about political activism, but you actually found a narrow niche thing. You found a way to get it done. I mean, it was one of the most impressive things I've ever seen in politics. Um, let me ask you this. What do you think the next thing is going to be? I mean, because right now the, the ruling still stands. Do you think that the Librarian of Congress can change the ruling, or will they, or can the Obama administration pressure cause them to reevaluate or do we have to wait for legislative changes or what do you think the next development will be in this issue? Well, I mean, we have a number of bills percolating. We have Senator Wyden who introduced a bill. Uh, just today we had uh, Senator Lee and Klobuchar that introduced a bill. Um, we know that on the House side there's going to be several bills introduced, one of them by uh, Congressman Jason Chaffetz probably co-sponsored by Jared Paul. So there's a lot of momentum across the Hill. Uh, but the question is exactly how far are you going to go? Are you actually going to check the box here? Um, or are you actually going to fix the problem? And, you know, it's unfortunate in Washington, D.C., but a number of times on issues like this, um, members of Congress think they can get away with just checking the box. And right. We're going to make sure we hold the feet to the fire to say, no, this technology should actually be lawful, and that means doing more than just checking the box. But I mean that specifically. Senator Wyden's bill, he should be commended for introducing a bill, the first bill actually on this matter, but the bill only says that if an individual unlocks their phone, then they're not criminally liable, that, 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 that the unlocking is, is, is now allowed. Well, that's terrific. But now we have 114,000 people who've signed this petition. We have a national campaign, and that's not good enough. And it's not good enough because still developing the tools is against the law. Selling the tools are, is against the law. So persons may be able to unlock their phones, 
But if the technology is still illegal, then you haven't actually solved the problem. Right. So that's that's our, our primary concern with Biden's bill. But obviously, this legislation goes through lots of revisions, and, and, and they'll probably, or they should fix it. But even beyond that, you know, we've exposed that we have a process that by default, almost like an entitlement system, just by default, we've inherited a legal regime that banned entire classes of technology. And that should be very disturbing. And that should require us to take an honest um, approach to, uh, to take a relook at our policies to say, okay, so we have laws that have inherently banned whole classes of technology. Let's go through that. Let's have an oversight hearing. Is that really logical without any governmental interest to do so? So what's, you know, some of these other technologies that should also be on the table. Yeah. Uh, 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 jailbreak. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, jailbreaking your iPhone um, is another one of those technologies that has to petition every three years in order to be lawful. And until very recently, that was against the law. Well, there's 23 million jailbroken devices. Are you telling me that there are 23 million felons in the United States? It's absurd. And in fact, even today, now that there's the exception, again, developing the tools for jailbreaking or selling the tools is still illegal, but jailbreaking your phone as a person is lawful, but jailbreaking an iPad is, is illegal. Right. So these, these rules are kind of crazy. So that's the second issue. And the third issue is, is the, the most important to me, which is accessibility technology for persons who are deaf or who are blind. We're talking about closed caption technology or read aloud functionality and several other tools. That technology is against the law. Right. So I want you to think about that for a second. There are persons who are deaf or who are blind, and we have tools that could help them, but we have laws that make it illegal to sell, develop, or use those tools. Right. That's crazy. And so the idea that these things can't also be on the table, now that we're taking a look at this issue overall, these issues should all be on the table. No, I agree. And... Um... Let, let me ask you, um, have you looked into this recent issue that's arising, which is the uh, – and again, I don't want to put you on the spot with something we, we didn't uh, discuss ahead of time. But in the, the 1976 Copyright Act reform, which I think Jimmy Carter was the president, signed, which came into effect in 1978, there was a provision which said that starting in 1978, there's a new – way that authors of copyrighted works, including books or software or music or whatever, they can liberate their works 35 years after the publication, which starting in 1978 is, hello, 2013. So starting this mm -hmm. year, starting this year, there's going to be a spate of disputes, litigation, controversies, whatever, where authors of songs and novels and software have the right under the 1978 provisions to liberate their works from the control of the publishers. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this issue, but it's something I'm, I'm about to write about. I think it's an important mm -hmm. issue. Um, do, do you know what I'm talking about? No, this is, a, this is an issue that wasn't on my radar. Yes, so so basically, uh, as of January 1st, 1970, uh, ni well, 2013, because it's 35 years after 1978, to January 1st, if you have assigned a copyright to some company of a book or a novel, you know, or a painting or a movie or a song or a software program, you have the right to request by a certain procedure that you get your, your rights back. Um, and I actually am very hopeful about this because I think – so this is going forward. So starting this yeah, year, you're going to – it's going to affect soon. Yeah. So you're – well, it's, it's in effect now. So right now you have a lot of uh, music uh, you know, artists that are requesting you know, famous mu music musicians, etc., they're starting to send these letters back to their publishers saying, I want my rights back. And you have to have a two-year window. You have to have a certain procedure, 
etc. So I think this is a positive development. Um, uh, I just wonder what do you see as the what do you see going forward, and what do you think is going to happen with the DMCA um, uh, process that you and the unlocking issue? What do you think will happen? Do you because th Obama has already responded positively. The Obama administration has responded positively to your petition. So yeah. I don't know what sway they have over the Librarian of Congress, but do you think it will change, or do you think – I mean, what do you think is going to happen? Well, I, I think it's going to require legislation to fix this, and in fact, that's what the White House statement was, is that they support legislation to fix this. And now we know that there's many bills in Congress, there's bipartisan support, many of the major leaders in this issue – uh, such as Patrick Leahy, for example, who's a very influential member on the Democratic side he, as the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, um, they've signaled that they're supportive of this. So there are, it's, it's starting to get real momentum on Capitol Hill to actually address this unlocking issue. Now, where we go from there is, is, is this question up in the air. I think that there are many other issues that also need to be addressed in this manner. Now, it's, it's unfortunate on Capitol Hill, but many people think on Capitol Hill that piracy is a real problem. So therefore, anything that we do to copyright, we can never change copyright because changing copyright means you're soft on piracy. Right. But that's, that's, a stupid, I mean, that's a stupid argument, which is we can be strong against piracy and support copyright, but say, you know, take an analytical look at our laws in the books and evaluate if it's the most effective way of protecting copyright. And I think that this is what the cell phone issue forces us to do, is it forces us to realize that we've created copyright policies that are so broad, they actually impact things that have nothing to do with piracy or copyright. And so those other issues I mentioned before, like jailbreaking and the accessibility technology, man, if, if those aren't included in this bill, you'll probably see another petition from me to push on those issues, because those are just no-brainers. Um, but... After that, there are other issues that need to be addressed as well. Um, I think the most egregious beyond those would be what I call the heckler's veto. Uh, it's not what I call the heckler's veto, but it, it, this, this is the pinnacle of the heckler's veto, which is under the DMCA, there's this takedown request process where anyone could file a takedown with a website, and the website's supposed to take that content down, and you're supposed to say, this is infringing upon my copyright, and then they just abide by that request. Right. Well, what happens in effect is it creates a heckler's veto, where the websites just take down the content without... ...piracy online, allowing... ...that they don't like is extremely problematic and runs afoul of the First Amendment. In fact, we know that it's been wildly used, for example, is in 2008 and 2012. Go ahead. So uh, we got cut off, but you were talking about the heckler's veto, which is an expression I really like. Go ahead. Sure. So the Digital Millennium Copyright Act allows for anyone to do a takedown request, and then most providers just take down that content. And it's supposed to protect copyright, but in effect, there really isn't a safeguard system. And so in 2008 and 2012, campaign videos for John McCain, um, people filed takedown requests against them on YouTube saying it violated their intellectual property. And Google took the website, the, the, the videos down in the weeks preceding the election. And the same thing happened with Governor Mitt Romney's campaign in 2012 with campaign videos. And in, in neither of those times was there any legitimate or even arguable copyright claim. It was a clear example of a heckler who didn't like Governor Romney and who didn't like Senator John McCain trying to inhibit their presidential campaign. And it's a very dangerous precedent. And um, those aren't the only examples, but those are perhaps the most egregious examples. So those are some other logical reforms that could be on the table going forward. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, well, I think we've exhausted this topic, and I appreciate your time. So let me ask you, what's, what, what do we have going forward for Derek Khanna? What's your next project? Because you've been amazingly uh, effective in what you've done so far. What, what's your, what, what are your future plans? 
Well, you know, it's, it's now, uh, I think it's two months since I left Capitol Hill, and it looks like we have a bill in Congress, and uh, I'm going to be continuing to run uh, across Capitol Hill to get this bill across the finish line, but also to have some really solid hearings. And I think the hearings are almost more important, is actually bringing in the people and talking about this law and having a conversation on it. So I'm, I'm going to be continuing to work on technology reform issues and uh, and I have a website up, which is called fixcopyright.com, and uh, your listeners can continue to follow me there, and also follow me on Twitter. My uh, handle is at Derek Kana. This is sorry, at Derek Kana, and Kana is spelled K-H-A-N-N-A. Well, that's great. And uh, look, I commend you for what you've done. You've done great service for liberty and the free market and property rights, and. Uh, just keep going, and I, I look forward to watching you in the future and see what you produce, because I think you're a rising star in the liberty movement. Oh, you're too kind to say that. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Derek. Appreciate it.